Well, good morning. Last week, we uh, went through the longest continuous discourse that we have of Jesus speaking. And you remember that that ended with Jesus' prayer in John, with his prayer in John 17. And um, although we applied that, and I think it's correct to apply that, to things happening today, remember where we were, that, the significance of that really was to his own disciples. Now, I, I want you to think about why would he pray for his own disciples to have unity? And if you think about it, they're what? We're not prone. <laughs> well, we're not prone to it, but also look at this motley crew he had assembled. Did you ever think about that? This crew he had assembled, one guy is a tax collector and another guy is a zealot. Now the zealots believed the Roman occupation was wrong and they went so far as to say anybody cooperating with the Romans should be killed. So you've got this one guy saying everybody cooperating with the Romans should be killed and you have another guy who's cooperating with the Romans. Maybe it's appropriate to pray for their unity. <laughs> That's what Jesus was praying for. But John, remember, writes things down for one purpose. Why does John write it down? So we might, might believe. Because his point is, by the time he's writing, those disciples have all died for their faith. They've all died for their faith. They were unified. They were willing to die like Jesus did. So in that sense, Christ's prayer was answered. He is saying the reason you can believe in Jesus is because these disciples, this motley crew, were unified. And they believed in me. And I want you to believe in me. Today, we're going to talk about the crucifixion. And John's picture of the crucifixion is a stunning picture. Because remember, of the accounts we have of the crucifixion, and all the Gospels cover the crucifixion, Mark was not a witness. Luke was not a witness. Matthew and John were the witnesses to that. But John is the one who is closest. We pick up in John 18. It tells us where they're going, because John remembers this clearly. Remember, John is writing here 50 to 60 years after the event. And he still remembers walking across, walking across the little creek going down to the base of the valley, and then going up to this place that the other Gospels call the Mount of Olives. John just says there was an olive grove there, and then his disciples went to it. Um, Brian, talk about, go ahead, give us some insight. We're, we're going to do this different today. We're not going to be one and then the other. We're going to kind of we both had a lot to say. We couldn't divide it up. We argued and argued. <laughs> Thank you. There's a lot in verse 2. So verse 2, now Judas would betray them all from either place. For Judas often met there with his disciples. So this is Uh, 
<laughs> they were getting arrested. <laughs> And why do you think they fell back? You know, did, did they fall back? I think it's because um, maybe they'd, they'd heard about Jesus. They'd heard about the things they'd done. For the Roman guards, this may have been the first time they've actually seen Jesus. But they've heard about the guy. They know they're coming to arrest him. And they look at him and they go, whoa, this is the guy. Maybe that's the reaction. Go ahead. That's true. That's true. So they know what they're doing. Yeah. Then 
Simon Peter having a sword drew it and struck the high chief's servant and cut off the great ear. The servant's name was Malchus. This is the only name of the chief Malchus. I think we have kind of visualized it. Peter is a full service, wrath, fiery guy, right? He's always the first to be very extreme. With, with a foot wash in the <laughs> Wasn't that Michael Tyson? Oh. <laughs> very true. And that's why the spirit of truth has to come and guide him into all truth. But the other thing that you mentioned, that Malchus, this is the only place he's mentioned, in the other Gospels, it doesn't tell you it's Peter who did this. So both Peter and Malchus are not mentioned in the other Gospels. Now you need to think about that. By the time John is writing this, they're dead. It's okay to say it was Peter who did this. When the other Gospels are being written, you're just going to say, one of the guys. <laughs> because, you know, they could, they, could be, they could be arrested for doing something like this. This is a serious offense. I mean, trying to kill somebody, but even cutting off their ear. Even today, you might be arrested for this. Well, maybe. You know, you, you don't know all the stuff that's going on here. And we can, uh, we, we can sort of suppose some things going on but it, it's pretty interesting so he cuts his ear off yeah poor old malchus <laughs> i mean it's also worth noting this is a, it's a rough world these guys are living in peter is carrying a sword so he didn't know what was going to happen that night but he's these guys probably all had uh weapons just because they traveled and there was highwaymen on the road that would that would get people in between towns They, yeah, they may have, but I'm talking when they're when they're out and about, and they're fishermen, those kinds of things. So there's uh, right, right. I know a lot about fishing. I always take a knife when I go. <laughs> Every time I go to King Supers, I carry my yeah. knife. <laughs> <laughs> so Jesus tells him to put his sword away um, and then asks him shall I not drink the cup that the father has given me um, again just reinforcing he knows what's coming so the they arrest him and they led him to Annas who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas who was the high priest that year so Annas was actually the high priest uh, over a decade before and he had several sons but they go to him almost out of respect because he's the patriarch of the of the family now it is interesting here that John is the only one who tells us about Annas the other Gospels don't mention Annas they mention just Caiaphas isn't it interesting too that we're talking about Caia Caiaphas was the high priest that year that should bother you if you know your Old Testament because the high priest was supposed to be a lifetime appointment but it was no longer a lifetime appointment by the time of the Romans because they'd taken that over. You can see the control that the Romans had over the Jews at this point. But Annas had sons who all became high priests. Five sons? Is that what my notes say? Mm -hmm. five. Yeah, he had five sons who all became high priests later on. And this is his son-in-law, Caiaphas. So Annas is very much the patriarch of the high priests. They go to him first. 
But don't get confused by who he's going and when he's going, because although he's going to be there for a short amount of time, there's then an aside that goes in here, and we're going to pick up when he's back with Caiaphas. But go ahead. Okay. It was, uh, so it introduced, introduces Caiaphas. Then it says in 15, verse 15, Simon Peter followed Jesus and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. But Peter stood outside the door, so the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl, who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. So this is uh, an issue Kim and I do not have unity on. <laughs> Kim does not believe that this other disciple was John, and I'll let him tell you why. I do. So we'll, we'll give you kind of both sides of the argument. Okay, here. so you want to hear why it's not John? Because in the other places where the other dis where John refers to, it, it is usual for John to refer to himself in like another disciple. But it is almost, all, in all the other cases we have, the other disciple whom Jesus loved. So here he doesn't say that. You say, well, it might be inappropriate for him to say that. The second thing is, you have to remember where John is from. John is from Galilee. He's not from there in Jerusalem. So he's like Peter. He would be recognized as a Galilean. So I'm not sure that it was him. Then the next thing, the, the other argument you have is, when they go in, it says he knew the high priest. Now, why would a fisherman know the high priest because the high priest in Jerusalem is a big time deal and there's no way John would have known this guy unless he delivered fish to his door but that would have been unusual because he's clear up in Galilee and this is down in Jerusalem I can't imagine John carrying fish to his door and saying here's your fish today sir you're not going to deliver it to the high priest anyway you're going to deliver it to the servant girl so here, I think it's unusual, but I think it is not John. I'll tell you who I think it is. I think it's either Nicodemus or Joseph of Arimathea. But I'll put that in your mind. Go ahead and give your defense. Yeah, indeed, and, and the this and the are disputed. If you look at these scholars and what they say about this, there is no, um, some of them say that disciple. There is nothing in the Greek about that. The correct translation is just another disciple. So they have sort of extrapolated that out. What is the Greek word before disciple? I don't know. I didn't bring my Greek. I was going to bring a little Greek with me, but he was doing my laundry. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh so. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so, there are there are uh, scholars on both sides of this issue. Um, there are certainly a, a number that agree with Kim, and there's a number that that think that this was John. I think it was John because um, John's not just a, a fisherman. John is the son of Zebedee. Zebedee was a wealthy fisherman who owned boats and employed men. So he's kind of a captain of industry, and the fishing industry is the most important, or one of the most vital industries in this whole region. So it would be likely that, that Zebedee, at least, was known to a lot of people in the higher society. Um, in addition, this portion of the text includes a lot of detail. Um, and it's maybe more detail than, than I would t say if I wasn't a, a direct eyewitness. So um, it, it lends itself to believe it, you to believe that John actually witnessed this, not that he heard it from somebody else. And that's um, true. You look at the amount of detail in there. When he goes on, he's t telling you it's cold. I remember it was cold. I remember it was the servant girl. You see all these things that could support a position like he has. Yeah. Then the other thing is, every, oh, nearly every other time that John references another disciple in the book of John, he calls them by name. Um, so he, he, during the Last Supper, he's, he references Judas, not Iscariot. He, he puts that out. Uh, uh, Kim mentioned that 
When Peter chopped off the ear, John's the only person that calls him by name. He calls the servant by name. The only person he doesn't call by name is himself, or he doesn't use a personal pronoun. He says the disciple Jesus loved, or in this case, another disciple, um, which is why some scholars believe that he's referencing himself. Uh, so that those are the two sides of that debate, the, the wrong and the right side. So. <laughs> It doesn't matter. <laughs> okay, so we get into Peter's denial of Jesus. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, you also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold. There's a detail that John's giving you. Uh, so this is a cold night. And they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. Um, so that's Peter's first denial. The high priest then questioned Jesus about the disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly in, to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me and what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is this how you answer a high priest? Jesus answered him, If what I said was wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said was right, why do you strike me? I like this verse because, again, this is John showing you Jesus is going right at the guy. Um, I think one of the things we've done as, as a Christian culture is made Jesus sort of, a, sort of a wimp a little bit sometimes. He's sort of, he's loving, and, and we, we like to talk about the loving, cuddly Jesus. But Jesus just got punched in the face, and he goes right at the guy. This is, this is a guard. He's, he doesn't even directly go to uh, Caiaphas, who's questioning him. He goes right at the guard and says, if I said something wrong, call me on it. Otherwise, um, don't. So he's almost inviting him. Do it again. I dare you. <laughs> um, and I think it's important that we, we emphasize that point, because I think um, sometimes... Uh, 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 tangent here. So I'm on a, I'm on a school board and we were, we were meeting a few weeks ago and one of the things we, we measure is this kid's writing skills. Okay, So we're looking at elementary school kids writing skills and the boys were dramatically behind the girls in the second, third, fourth, fifth grade levels um, in writing. And we couldn't figure out why that was. It was going on for years. Then we started looking at the prompts, and the prompts are the things that the kids have to write about, they're the questions, and then the stories that were being read in the classroom. And the prompts were, um, describe your day at the park, a picnic with your family. And so the girls are writing these beautiful stories about the family, we were playing frisbee, there was butterflies and birds, and the boys didn't care, right? <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> The boys' stories were like, we were at the park. <laughs> so so we, we had an administrator who had sons. And so she started reading or encouraging the teachers to read stories about superheroes and, and guys of strength. And then asking prompts on the tests about write a story about a superhero. And the boys wrote about fights and all of a sudden they're pulling out adjectives you didn't even know they could spell and they're they're thriving because they identify with strength and I think sometimes we when we try to promote masculinity the perception is that we're doing something um, negative negative to femininity and we're not but I think one thing that we've done in the church is just my opinion um, and Kim can pull me back off this tangent pretty soon uh, <laughs> is we've done a disservice to men by making Jesus a wimp, an effeminate, um, cuddly, lovable wimp most of the time. And so we have boys that are growing up, and then when Satan confronts them, they're getting slaughtered, and not in a, a self-sacrificial way, they're getting eaten alive. 
And that's why when I look around, I'm 34, when I look around at the guys that I went to high school with or college with, Christian high school, Christian college, none of them go to church. Their lives are wastelands. And they're littered with, with women and uh, kids that never knew what a man looked like. Because the little boy didn't know what a man looked like. And I think we do a disservice to men if we don't emphasize these points of strength, that Jesus was strong. And John, over and over and over in this chapter, tells you Jesus is powerful. He is strong. He, Jesus is a man. Um, and, and that gives little boys and, and men something to look towards and to, to want to be like. And so I, I would encourage us as we take this away, in those moments where you realize that Jesus is maybe being portrayed a little bit too soft, Look to these verses and, and, and remind the little guys, because they will thrive. It's just like the writing test. You show strength to a little boy, they're going to thrive. And we, we've got to do that. Uh, so that's my soapbox. Sorry. No, no, that's great. I'm, and I'm glad that is, that uh, I, I agree with, with what he's saying. What you may be wondering is in this whole passage, who are they in front of? Because they're talking about saying this to the high priest. And are they in front of Caiaphas or are they in front of Annas? Well, what you have to view is verses 15 through 23 are sort of a aside. You see, in our Western minds, we want the Bible to be chronological. So we make the Bible into something that we want. We do that all the time. We make the Bible into what we want it to be, not what it is. I'll get on a soapbox on that in a minute. But we make it about what we want it to be, and because of that, we want it to be in order. Well, what happens is, John wants to tell us about Peter here, and what happened, and Jesus with Peter in here. And he, he's, he, what he tells you is, he says, Caiaphas was the one who advised the Jews it would be good if one man died for the people. Anna sent him, still bound to Caiaphas, the high priest, He's in front of Caiaphas when he's doing this. Probably Annas and Caiaphas lived in the same place because the whole family was there. But he's in front of Caiaphas when this is going on. Oh yeah, it, what, what it is is illegal, and what it is is they're making a case, but Jesus is saying, go ahead. Uh, verse 25, now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So again, a reference to the cold night John remembers vividly. So they said to him, you are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, said... <laughs> Did I not see you in the garden with him? <laughs> like, did you not cut my cousin's ear off? <laughs> Peter again denied it, and the rooster crowed at once. Um, I think it's easy to pick on Peter for the denials. And you read those stories, and you say, you're with Jesus, and here's Jesus making his stand, and, and then you're backing down? Are you kidding me? But... I kind of read through it the first time with that mentality, and then I, then I thought about how, how often do I deny Jesus? Maybe not this way, maybe not, hey, are you a Christian? No, I don't believe in Jesus. But how often do I deny him with silence? How many people on the, on the day of judgment could look at me and said, say, y you knew about this? You knew him and said nothing? Um, and that, that may be helps me to identify with Peter a lot more in this scenario. This, um, are, are we denying him in our day-to-day -day lives? I, I think that's a question that we all have to ask. Um, right? Right. And, and Jesus even says, when he, every time Jesus predicts his own death and talks about it, he, 
he, he a lot of times he'll reference he'll even say to them you don't understand now but you will eventually so Peter's in this point right now that he probably does not understand what's going on. He's confused. He's scared for his life. He doesn't know what's going on with Jesus. Um, a lot of times, maybe what I'm scared of is making it awkward with someone. I'm, I'm not scared for my life. <laughs> um, so so I, I understand where Peter's coming from with this. Well, and, it, and it's interesting because by the time John writes this, remember, Peter has been killed for his faith. So the people know that there was a time when Peter denied Jesus. But in the end, Peter stands up for Jesus and is executed because of his faith. And they know that. And that ought to give each one of us a whole amount of hope. It really does. It gives me a lot of hope. Because it says what you can recover from. It's, it's not part of the, the Bible. Um, it is part of uh, the apocryphal stories that came out about Peter. And a lot of what we know about uh, the disciples comes from stories that we aren't really sure of. So it may have happened, may, may not have happened. Um, we, just, we just don't know about a lot of those things. But look what happens now in verse 26. No, 28. The Jews led Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. Now, Roman had a lot of trouble with this area. And so they had put a governor in charge to take care of things. And this governor, of course, we know as Pilate. Now look what it says in John. It says, by now it was early morning. i got to tell you that one of the uh, disputes is, what time of the day is it at this point? Because Mark says it's the sixth hour. John, in the, the text here, actually says it's the ninth hour. The sixth hour would be about, uh, or John, Mark says it's the third hour, sorry. Third hour, which would be at nine o'clock in the morning. John says it's about noon. So is it 9 o'clock or noon? You see, that's, a, that's our Western minds again saying, I want the Bible to be, I, I'd like it to be all in chronological order, and I'd like everything to fit in so I don't have to wonder about all these little contradictions that I see. Because we're getting into the part here where the crucifixion happens and the resurrection where the accounts are vastly different. And you know what? We'd like them all to be the same because that's what we think. But I will tell you that if you are a witness in a case and, and, or you're a, a jury and you're listening to witnesses, if every witness gets up there and tells you exactly the same story, you don't believe them. But if they each tell you their own story about what they saw, with their own eyes, you believe what they saw. Now John's going to tell us, you know, I, th I think it was about maybe 9 o'clock in the morning. Or uh, he says, I'm going to think, uh, I think it's about noon. Mark's saying, I think it's 9 o'clock in the morning. You know what, it doesn't matter. Because they've been up all night and a lot has happened to them. And what they're saying is, golly, we went there and it, w it was still the morning. And those details, to me, reinforce the fact that this isn't made up. John is telling us this. He's telling us his story about Jesus so we can believe. He already knows Mark's story and Matthew's story and Luke's stories. He's read them. John's a supplement to those. He could have said, you know, Mark said this, but I dispute that. 
He doesn't do that because that isn't the point. The point is he's telling us his story. So I love this, the way that this goes on. Again, don't make the Bible into something we want it to be. Let the Bible be what it is. God could have fixed it all. I have no doubt about that, but he didn't. He left contradictions. We hate that word, don't we? He left things that may not even be true because he wanted people to tell their story. He wants you to tell it the way you see it. The way you see it may be different from the way I see it. But we have to tell our story. All right, so they get there. They're worried about eating the Passover. Do you realize you can't even, the, the accounts in the Bible, people disagree about what day Jesus was killed on. We can't even settle what day was he crucified on. There's a huge group out there that believes he was crucified on Wednesday night. There's another group out there that believes he was crucified on Thursday night. God doesn't settle it. God doesn't say Jesus was crucified at, you know, at noon on Thursday night. Because it doesn't matter. The whole point is, he was crucified. And I'll tell you, there is no doubt among even historians of the time, even people who never believe in Christianity, that there was a Jesus who was crucified. You can take that as a fact. Because that's what God wants you to know. Don't make the Bible say something that it doesn't say. Okay, I was on my horse now. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so Jesus is before Pilate. Um, Pilate's now questioning him. The Jews don't even go, they don't go in to see Pilate um, so Pi because their their laws and everything. So Pilate actually goes out to them, says, w what are you accusing this guy for? Um, they answer him. Um, Pilate goes back in to question Jesus. And he says, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate, I think, is a bad rap because ultimately, you know, he's part of Jesus getting crucified. I think from the very beginning, Pilate's trying to get out of this. He doesn't want any part of this. Um, Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me, but what have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting, that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not from the world. So Jesus is standing in front of a very powerful ruler in his region of the world. And Jesus is telling him, My kingdom's bigger than yours. That's pretty cool. <laughs> um, he, he's, and, and, and Pilate doesn't necessarily balk at that too much um, and you'll see again later he 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 doesn't necessarily balk at that so Pilate says so you're a king Jesus answered you say that I am a king for this purpose I was born and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice Pilate said to him what is truth we're still asking that question in our culture today but Jesus tells him what truth was. Truth is what I came here for. I'm bearing witness about, ultimately, himself uh, for, the, for the will and glory of God. Um, after he said this, he went back outside of the Jews and said, I find no guilt in him. So keep in mind, Pilate, his authority as king was just questioned, essentially, by Jesus saying, my kingdom is bigger and better than yours. But he goes out and says, I find no guilt in this man. Um, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at Passover. So do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They cried again. They cried out, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. We don't really know anything about this custom. There's not really anything. This is really the only place that we find this custom. Um, so we're really not sure why they released a prisoner on the Passover or, or, or what, but um, there it is. 
probably. Appease the Jews, probably. So I like this now because then Pilate takes Jesus and has him flogged. Now Jesus should have been flogged by the Jewish authorities because they had a rule in Judaism. You can read the Old Testament, it tells you. If you're flogging somebody, you can only give them uh, 49, 48 stripes. And none of them can cut their flesh under Jewish law. The Romans had no such law. So he's flogged under the Roman law, which is much worse. Then the soldiers, and you know this story, the soldiers make fun of him. And then Pilate goes out again and he says, I'm bringing him out to you. I don't find any basis for a charge against him. But look what the Jews do. They put Pilate up against a wall. Because when they're saying crucify him, Pilate says, we're in 197. We have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was more afraid. He went back inside the, the palace. Where did you come from? He asked Jesus. Where did you come from? Where did he think Jesus came from? Pilate already knew at this point Jesus was from Galilee. This isn't... Pilate already knew that. He's not asking Jesus, did you come from Galilee? What's John's point in the whole book? Where did Jesus come from? He came from God. So do you see why Jesus doesn't answer him? Jesus doesn't answer him because Pilate wouldn't understand the answer. Pilate then says, don't you know that I have the power to free you or crucify you? And Jesus says, you have no power from over me unless it were given from above. From then on, verse 12, it says, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jews kept shouting, if you let this man go, you're no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. The Caesar at this time was Tiberius. Tiberius was an exceedingly, all of them were, but he was exceedingly jealous. And Tiberius had already executed for people for saying he was not the king. So he, they know that he's, if, the, if Pilate releases him, and it gets back to Tiberius, that Pilate had released somebody who had claimed to be a king, Tiberius would be furious with Pilate. Now, if Tiberius is furious with Pilate, what happens to Pilate? Well, at least he loses his job. <laughs> and he eventually does anyway. You know what? For, for a long time they said that this man Pilate never existed. And then finally, it is fairly recently, they found an inscription on a bench in a Colosseum that apparently was Pilate's bench because it has his name on it. That's the only external evidence we have that there was indeed a man called Pilate who was in charge of the Jews. So Pilate comes out and he says... It's about the sixth hour. That's John in verse 14 saying it's about the sixth hour. The sixth hour would be noon. That's where Mark says it's about the third hour. Here's your king, he says. They shouted, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? And they say, we have no king but Caesar. Do you see they're making this into a Roman crime? They couldn't crucify Jesus for doing stuff against Jewish law like what they really wanted to do. So they had to convince Pilate he was claiming to be a king. And so they say, let's crucify him. So they take him. I, I love verse 17. Carrying his own cross, John says. He went on to the place of the skull. The other Gospels say that Simeon came and was coerced into carrying the cross for Jesus. 
So do you see that somebody who is looking at this says, so did Jesus carry his own cross or not? John remembers Jesus carries his own cross because John is Jesus' best friend. He remembers that Jesus was very weak and he remembers him walking out carrying his own cross. And that's what he tells us. Now, if at some point somebody else helped him carry the cross, that isn't really a contradiction to this. It's just, it's what the movie says. It's just, John doesn't choose to tell us that. Because what John is trying to emphasize is, Jesus carried the cross because he carried the cross for you. We're going to have to leave Jesus there. But I want you to rest assured that Jesus does not stay on the cross. Next week, we'll finish the cross, talk about the resurrection, and we'll finish the book of John. Um, I think John is the last book that the disciple John wrote. Um, next quarter, starting in December, our very own Mike Stewart, <laughs> right, is going to uh, teach a class on 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, which I think he wrote before he wrote his gospel. Um, you know, everybody has their own opinion. They can be wrong. But I, I think this is written very late. I think this was written after he wrote the book of Revelation. I think this book is written very late because he is facing a group of people who are not believing that Jesus is the Christ. And John's purpose is to say, I'm writing this so you can believe. I think he's the last one around who could tell them I was an eyewitness. We'll see you next week.